On our desert island this week is Peter Ustinov. Peter, you're one of the most travelled men I know. Have you had any experience of desert islands? Uh, not really desert islands. I was in Yugoslavia this year, and there are quite a lot of uninhabited islands, mm. but uh, one is careful not to be wrecked on them, because it would mean one would have to swim a hundred yards uh, to the mainland. Um, <laughs> so I don't think you can really count those desert islands. What would you be happiest to have got away from? I said this year, uh, on one occasion, that my idea of paradise was a country without telephones. And my idea of hell is a place where telephones don't work. <laughs> <laughs> you have a very large collection of records. How did you set about cutting them all down to eight? I've selected records on the whole uh, which are difficult to remember. Because those I can remember easily, I can hum to myself. Mm -hmm. And some of the more energetic things. I think at my age, uh, my selection tends to be languorous, rather slow moving and majestic. Which, what is, of course, is a reflection of their owner. <laughs> what is the first one? My first choice is by Berlioz, whom I always consider one of the most sensuous of all composers, uh, Le Spectre de la Rose, one of his songs sung by Janet Baker, who is certainly among the leading singers of today and one of the leading musical intelligences around. The Spectre de la Rose, sung by Janet Baker. And we talked about your travels. They started very early, didn't they? Well, they started uh, prenatally, really. I did an awful lot of travelling as extra weight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, From where? From Leningrad. I think my uh, embryonic state was uh, started in Le Leningrad. And uh, I was eventually born, after a narrow squeak in uh, Amsterdam, in Swiss Cottage. Mm. Adelaide Road, to be precise. <laughs> you went to one of the most English schools, Westminster, top hats and tailcoats. Were you bright at school? No, I was a matte finish on the whole. And uh, I once said that uh, I thought the British education was probably the best in the world if you could survive it. If you couldn't, there was nothing left for you but the diplomatic corps. <laughs> And I still feel that quite strongly on occasion. <laughs> you were interested in, in, in writing and, and designing and acting and, and, and producing and all those excellent things. Why did you opt for drama? My mother's family is all painters, and uh, inevitably a family of large size with traditions of that sort tend to become a kind of mutual admiration society or even a, a mutual condemnation society, which is just as bad. 
I was dying to do something slightly different for the rest of them. And uh, I even got a letter from my great uncle, uh, Alexandre Benoit, when I actually started saying, for centuries our family has been prowling round the theatre. Uh, we have designed them, we have built them, we have do done scenery in them, we have conducted and we have composed. At last, one of us has had the sheer gall to clamber upon the boards himself. <laughs> Your first job was at the Players' Theatre, doing a sort of variety turn. What was the first play you did? Well, the first play of all was an early version of Chekhov's Uncle Vanya, called uh, The Wood Demon. Where did you do that? At the Barn Theatre at Shear oh, in Sussex. Yes. Or is it Surrey? Anyway, Sorry, I think. I think yes. so too, yes. Mm. And uh, I was wearing my grandfather's smoking jacket, which was my only real connection with the past on that occasion, and I was listening to the overture was uh, Tchaikovsky's uh, Polonaise from Eugene Onegin, and I can't listen to this to this day without feeling stage fright, and I don't suffer from stage fright anymore, but when I hear that, I remember the emotions of being on the stage for the first time, and I believe I had the first line, which were as difficult to remember as any of Chekhov's. It was something like, Will anybody have any more ham? <laughs> no, those things are very difficult to remember. You were already playing a character part. Oh, indeed I was. What was your first film job? My first film job was in an absurd film called Hello Fame, uh, on which I was on a spangled ladder climbing to a ceiling and waving together with other promising young people. I had Jean Kent on the next ladder and she a got to the top much quicker than I did. Sort of Busby Berkeley. Number. A sort of Busby Berkeley in a room 10 feet by 10 feet somewhere in Paddington. We've got you launched. Let's have another disc. Well, I think I will take a non-vocal one, the second movement from Prokofiev's second violin concerto, which is an absolute... When I first heard it, I played it 15 times without stopping, and it's played here by Mexico's glory, the Polish violinist Henrik Schering. <laughs> The opening of the second movement of Prokofiev's second violin concerto, Henrik Schering with the London Symphony Orchestra. You had your own first play on when you, you were only, what, 19? No, I wrote it when I was 19. It went on when I was 20, 21, really. Mm -hmm. um, I was 21, yes, in 1942. Yes, you had joined the army. You were a, a not very dashing private, I believe. You had been rejected for the Secret Service. Yes, I had indeed. I hate to talk about my failures in this way, but my father engineered a meeting between a gentleman who was supposed to be reading the News Chronicle, which was then a popular uh, liberal newspaper, in front of Sloan Square's underground station, uh, which is there to this day, of course. And I saw a man standing there who was very obviously not reading the paper, just looking at it. 
and I was supposed to go up to him and say, excuse me, sir, can you guide me to number 9 Eaton Square? And he was supposed to say, I'm going in that very direction. And then we walked off. I did that, and he looked at me, searching my face for evidence of all sorts of things. As we walked off, he said to me, Parlez-vous la Française? I said, oui, monsieur. Sprechen Sie Dutch? I said, ja, mein Herr. He said, good man. And we walked a few paces, and then he said I would uh, be informed. And he walked away, and, and then I got turned down after all my efforts. Uh, a measure, of course, which disappointed me as a spy, but on the other hand gave me enormous encouragement as an actor, because he said, uh, unfortunately, my face would be uh, very difficult to lose in a crowd. Well, your talents were, were pounced on, and you began to work in the Army Kinematographic Unit with very distinguished people like Colonel David Niven and Captain Carol Reed, and you had a headquarters at the Ritz Hotel, but you were still this not terribly military-looking private. For a while you got by uh, as David Niven's Batman, I believe. Yes, well, under the establishment of the British Army, which hadn't changed since Waterloo, there was no possible way of keeping a private together with a colonel unless one was the Batman of the other. So that I used to work on the script of the film we were doing, which was called The Way Ahead, uh, in the Ritz Hotel, with David hovering near the door. Occasionally he would say, K.V., and I would throw the script away and pick up his belt and start polishing it, and the general would look in and say, Morning! We'd both say, Good Morning. I'd stand up, and as soon as he'd gone, I'd throw the belt down on the floor <laughs> rather violently and pick up the script again. It was, it was a series of absolutely absurd situations. Mm -hmm. Record number three. Well, record number three is quite uh, interesting, I think, because I started in the theatre, really. My mother's a designer. She was a designer and a painter. And, in fact, I had to paint shoes and backdrops from a very early age to help her out. And she did an, a ballet with Anthony Tudor called Dark Elegies, the music for which haunted me from an early age, which was the Kindertoten Lieder by Mahler. And this is one of them, sung, of course, by the inimitable Kathleen Ferrier. <laughs> Alt 
one of Mahler's Kindertoten Lieder of Denkisch, sung by Kathleen Ferrier. You've written Getting On for 20 plays, Peter. Which is your favourite play? Of mine? Yes. I don't know. I think probably Photo Finish is, in a way, which I think went further uh, than the others, and, of course, was tremendously experimental, in spite of the fact that it was absolutely naturalistic to look at. But the fact of a play running on four different time levels at once uh, is a technical accomplishment of which I'm rather proud, because it actually works when you see it. And I've seen it in the most extraordinary countries. But at the same time, I hate saying which is my favourite play, because there was a play more recently called Halfway Up the Tree, which I was told by the critics, and even partially by the public, not to be terribly proud of. It was all right, and it was played very, very skillfully by Robert Morley in London, ran a long time. It was a disaster in Paris. It went well in Germany, but not terribly well in America. And I was told it was a lightweight piece. I saw it the other day in Leningrad, played by people that obviously did not have the benefit of my advice, because I had no <laughs> idea they were playing it. And I can only tell you that I really saw the play as it was written for the first time. And I began at the end to look at it as though it had been written by somebody completely different, and yet it was exactly, they hadn't changed the word, and it was marvellous. Latterly, you've been playing a lot in other people's films. You've been playing all over the place, rather extraordinary parts, some of them. Uh, a one-legged sailor, Yugoslavian sailor, isn't it? No, it's a one-legged uh, German uh, sergeant major ah. from the um, Foreign Legion. That was Marty Feldman, who told uh, a, a press conference that he thought that I was a rather more verbal than physical comic. Uh, I said, well, you really put me on one leg and you say that. <laughs> what else have you been doing? Um, then I did a, a film in Ireland with a French director, and now I'm going to play Hercule Poirot. Murder on the Nile. Death on the Nile. Death on the Nile. Death death on the Nile, Nile, Nile yes. Yes. Record number four. Now, record number four is, after all, you can't have a program of this sort and not take Beethoven along. And Beethoven is one of the more difficult ones to remember. You always get things wrong, however well you know it. And I've selected uh, part of the um, uh, second movement of the third piano concerto, played on this occasion by Wilhelm Kempf, Professor Doctor. Part of the second movement of Beethoven's third piano concerto with Wilhelm Kempf as soloist. You've directed several operas, haven't you, Peter? Did you find that 
rewarding and exciting? It's a very difficult thing to do, Artra New and all the listeners, uh, simply because uh, you're dealing with uh, singers who, of course, know their parts musically in a most commendable way. I mean, you very rarely find actors that are so up on their parts at the first rehearsal. In fact, you never do. And you're delighted. You say, my goodness, where have I been all this time? This is marvellous. They all leap to the thing. Of course, the second uh, rehearsal resembles the first enormously because in the meanwhile they've sung Carmen and they've forgotten everything that you've told them. <laughs> and so it goes on until the end. There are some of them who are better singers, frankly, than actors. There are others that are good at both. There are a few who are not terribly good at either. And there are others who are so hardened in their profession that they roll with your punch and then on the first night when you can't get at them do exactly what they've always done <laughs> uh, so that one starts out usually euphorically by the end you're thoroughly depressed and then Mozart or whoever it is gallops to the rescue because you've really rather forgotten the music. I was very impressed to discover that you took singing lessons yourself at Rome Opera House. That was in M Metro Golden Mare trying to make Quo Vadis, the greatest film of all time. I took three lessons at Rome Opera House from a man who confided in me that he only did it because uh, he needed the money, because of the grandmother is old and the children are young. I said, well, uh, that, that consideration was not entirely absent from my thinking. <laughs> and he said, in three lessons to teach you to sing is impossible. Three years, perhaps, perhaps, but uh, three uh, three uh, lesson is impossible but I will try and squeeze uh, a year a lesson I said fine he said the first thing I always tell to Gobi the first thing to remember is to breathe with the forehead <laughs> I said what he said try you must always try to breathe with the forehead so I wrinkled my brow and tried to give the impression there was a small pulse in it and he said, you are really very really quick on the uptake. Uh, it's very good. Uh, tomorrow we will see how you improve. Uh, so tomorrow he, I went back. He said, now I will see how good uh, your memory. You will breed with the death. I said, forehead. Bravo. But it's incredible. So quickly you learn. Uh, then the second lesson I'm always telling to Gobi is not only breed with the forehead, but think with the stomach. I said, oh, I see. So I tried to wear a rather constricted look, as though I was thinking with my stomach and not forgetting to wrinkle my forehead to demonstrate that the little pulse was at work there. In the third lesson, he said, I will see how much you, if anything, you remember of the lesson so far. And I said, uh, yes. Then I ask you to think with the stomach. Bravo! <laughs> and to, to breathe with the forehead. It's incredible, I've never had the pupil so quick. And now the last thing I must tell you, the third lesson, as I always tell to Gobi, remember always under any circumstances to sing with the eye. And uh, I'm afraid that on occasion I might have forgotten to breathe with my forehead or to think with my stomach, but Never, never did I ever forget to sing with the eye. I think that's probably the only part of me that was really singing at times. <laughs> yes. Record number five. Record number five, well, you were talking about producing operas and probably the one I've enjoyed doing most and which probably I did best so far was The Magic Flute at Hamburg. And uh, this is the great aria, the great consoling and serene aria by Sarastro from that opera by Mozart, of course, and on this occasion sung by the great Finnish bass Talvela. Yes. 
Within these sacred walls from the magic flute sung by Talvela. One thing we haven't talked about, this is your autobiography, Dear Me. How did it feel to stand back and look at yourself so far? Uh, I was, curious enough, I found when I started more interested in my extreme youth and childhood than in what happened later on, which is really part of the, the public record, or I mean, I'm not being pompous, but at least people know more about that than mm -hmm. they do about all the secret difficulties I had when I was beginning and which humanly interested me now much more. But that's perhaps a symptom of growing old too, because I find that, or I have found in my life, that very, very old men remember things that happened in the first five years of their lives with a clarity which they never had when they were younger. Uh, we got to record number six. Well, number six is a really spoken record and it, I chose it in order to remind ourselves what things were like, how different they were, and yet how similar. It's the speech on the budget of 1909 by Mr. Asquith. I claim for the budget that it does not add a penny to the cost of the necessaries of life, but it asks all to contribute to the nation's needs, but it asks most from those who are most able and least from those who are least able to pay, and that it provides an expanding revenue to meet expanding liability. I am confident that the people will not grudge money spent on national defense and social development, and that they will repudiate as emphatically as they did three years ago the only alternative policy which would raise the price of food, restrict our open markets, and bring back the evils and injustices of protection. Mr. Asquith on the 1909 budget. Were you a Boy Scout? I guess I was, A yes. good one? A lion. A lion with red and yellow things in the wind. Uh, or ailerons or, or uh, stabilizers, according to which element you chose to be in. A lot of badges? No, I think I managed to light a fire with a match. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the trick of the week. That's the trick of the week. <laughs> you are a sailor, of course. Yes, I enjoy that very much. So I would uh, probably make every effort, after my initial relief of being on a desert island, I would make every effort to uh, build myself some kind of papyrus canoe in order to prove that Thor Heyerdahl was wrong on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Back to music, what next? Back to music, well, it's a revolutionary song sung by Mexicans, and I'd, I've always loved Mexico and their negligent approach to revolution. The fact that they can't really sing together, they make noises, they get in each other's way, and eventually they shoot each other because they've got a note which displeases the others. and. Uh, I love this kind of relaxed and lethal atmosphere. El sentinela paso revista El campamento ya se durmió A Dios le dice este villista revolutionary song from Mexico about Pancho Villa. Now we come to your last record. This is a song by Mussorgsky, uh, orchestrated by Igor Markevich, uh, called, I think, Little Star. And it's very redolent of uh, uh, endless, endless plains and gritty whitewashed churches with green or blue cupolas. 
and the sound of distantly barking dogs and a feeling that for miles and miles in every direction there is the same thing. Mussorgsky's song, Little Star, sung by Marsha Predit. If you only had one of the eight discs you've played us, which one would it be? I think it would probably be the Mozart, simply because he's the most enduring. The aria from the Magic Flute. Yes. And one luxury to take with you. One luxury. Oh, my goodness, that's a very difficult one. I might take a bathtub. Well, that's easy. We can heat the water with solar batteries. We can do all those tricks Exactly, for you. exactly. Mm -hmm. I think I do that simply in order to get rid of the salt after I'd had my morning dip. And one book, apart from that select list of the Bible and Shakespeare and big encyclopedias. Well, I don't want to appear frightfully conceited, but I think the only book that would keep me quiet would be an exercise book, uh, which I could fill myself. Or right. perhaps if you would give me paper rather than book, I'd be happier. Yes, as much paper and pencils as you like. And thank you, Peter Yusinov, for letting us hear your desert island discs. Thank you for the privilege of being allowed to visit your desert island yet again. Goodbye, everyone.